Hello there. Welcome to the short video on thinking strategies for level one and below learners. My name is Kelly Adams and I'm the product manager for level one and below, including work skills and personal growth and well-being. In this video, we're going to talk through some thinking strategies that might be useful when delivering some of our qualifications. So first question to ask is, what are thinking strategies? So thinking strategies are those real technical skills that can help learners understand their thinking in, at a really much deeper level. And that will also allow us to help support them to organise and sort through their thoughts in order to approach a task and manage to overcome those problems. So when we're using thinking strategies, we're helping them develop skills that they might need in the future and ways in which they can organise and sort their thinking. So in the short video we're going to look at today, we're going to consider strategies that we can as, as educators or as teachers or tutors teach learners who are studying the qualifications. And once you are able to support those by helping them develop these thinking strategies, that's going to help them um, when they face any particularly difficult challenges when they're trying to complete some of the assignment work that we ask for as part of some of our qualifications. So the first strategy that I recommend for thinking skills is a really simple one that you might already use or you might already use some versions of it. So strategy one is graphic organizers. Now graphic organizers are a really useful tool that can be used by learners to help them solve a particular problem, identify strategies or make decisions. But they're very, very useful because they're visual and they help learners to really organize those particular ideas. However, when using them, as you can see, there's some on the right hand side there, like T charts, Venn diagrams, concept maps. You'll be familiar with mind maps. It's really important that you model those so that when you ask learners to use them, they're clear about how they can use them to support and organize their ideas. We really need to emphasize on training them correctly to be able to use these in order to help them problem solve some of the difficulties they might face with their assignments. So these are really a great tool to use in order to meet the learners, I, the learners needs that they have in the classroom. Now, as I said previously, by presenting it graphically, that really helps some learners because having that visual support there helps them know what to do when they encounter a problem. And therefore, that will really help them in terms of progression, progress onto the next stage as they're highly accessible. So here's some examples of use of graphic organizers that we've seen in the classroom. So you might use what we call a Venn diagram on the left hand side, where they can identify simple concepts that they like and they don't like. You've got on the right hand side facts or opinions. So you might ask them to gather a list of facts about a particular topic or gather some opinions and they should therefore be able to identify which are facts and which are opin opinions and that will really help them to structure their writing in terms of the kind of ideas that they're putting down if they're putting them down onto video or onto paper. The second strategy that we're going to look at is something called learning journals. Now learning journals I've used in the past and I can tell you that they're very very useful in order to encourage independent learning because what you're getting to the learner to do is to think about the things that they have learned and put actions into place to develop that learning. So they really help develop the self-regulation process of some learners because we're considering the what and also the metacognitive level, the how. So by considering the what and the how, it helps us to identify how we can actually improve. Now, when I used these um, some time ago, it was really useful to see learners really identify with what they've learned in the classroom and how they learnt it. So if they come across a similar problem next time, they're able to identify and use that how. Um, and I think that's very, very powerful. Now, using the learning journals as well helps them identify the subject matter and it helps them deep deepen their understanding because we're not just presenting the learning to them and they're just learning we're also developing their thinking so we're getting to think about what they've learned and how they learned it 
and how they can apply it in different situations or how they could improve it. And that really helps learners develop their independent learning and thinking skills, which is extremely valuable in the classroom. So here's some examples of using learning journals. So you can see on the right hand side there, there's evidence that a learner has used some thinking notes and some different notes as well. So on the left hand side, we've got a list of suggestions or prompt questions that you can use in order to be able to model this technique with learners. Because remember, learners need scaffolding in order to do this well. So by giving them scaffolding, that's really going to help with their thinking process and move them forwards in terms of um, independent learning and those kind of things that we really want to encourage in our learners. Strategy three, we're going to look at checklists. So checklists are really, really useful, particularly for our SEND learners, uh, because they really value their learning being broken down into chunks in order to tackle a problem. The reason why they really value that is because what, what we're looking to do when we're doing that is make it so it's more manageable, so it's not overburdening to them, it's not stressing them out, so they know the process of what they're going to do. Now, many autistic learners really like to use a structure such as first, next, last, then um, as a way of understanding the progress that they're going to make and what's going to go in their lesson. So when they arrive at a lesson, they've got a piece of paper in front of them that breaks down those tasks. So it says first they're going to do this, next we're going to do this, last we're going to do this, and then this is what's going to happen, i.e. homework or some sort of activity that they take away. So helping them to break that down helps them move towards learning because they don't feel so overwhelmed or anxious about that learning. So it's helping them clearly have an understanding of what you're going to be teaching them in that day. Of course, as well as autistic learners, all learners can benefit from those kind of techniques because it helps them to feel in control of their learning and it removes any barriers to success such as anxiety or confusion over what's happening in the classroom. One of the things I really like about checklists is it helps keep learners on task so if you give them a list of things such as next, last, then, or a simple checklist, it helps them know, right, I've done that task, now I need to do this task. And that together with the review of a learning, such as a learning journal, helps them to really deepen and strengthen their understanding as well as providing accessible learning, which is really important. When you use these effectively, this is going to help develop the student's metacognitive awareness. So it's going to help them contribute and strengthen their own thinking process which is invaluable when they're doing assignment work and those kind of things. One of the things I found in the classroom as well is a checklist also can be a motivator because it helps them recognize they've achieved something. So if we do the first task and we think we've done a really good job and we share our learning and we get a bit of praise when we tick that box that's going to motivate a learner and encourage them to want to do more. So checklists can be, in different forms, a very, very powerful tool to use in the classroom. Here's some basic examples of checklists that can be used. So you can see on the left-hand side there, we've got a first, next, then last technique. And what you would do with that is you would write on, before the learner enters the room, the tasks in the order that you were going to work on those in that lesson. Then we've got a checklist, different kind of checklist on the right hand side, where um, you write the list of the tasks that you want the learners to be able to achieve in the classroom rather than what they're going to do. And then they tick it off when they think they've done it. Then we get the sense of motivation because they've ticked it. And the double motivation is if the teacher ticks it, then they've achieved it. And that really, really helps strengthen their understanding and motivation towards learning. The next strategy we're going to look at is Oracy Frameworks. So Oracy Frameworks was a tool that was developed by Voice21 and Oracy Cambridge. Now, these are a really good tool to help learners to understand what makes good talking when they're in different kind of contexts within the classroom. So 
what the people at Voice 21 and Norris of Cambridge did was they broke these skills down into four particular sections. So the first section is what we call the physical section. So that's all about the body language, the eye contact, the confidence to be able to um, speak about the things that are happening in the classroom or answer questions. Then we've got the linguistic side of it. So that's about the learners thinking about carefully the words that they're going to choose and bringing those together to be able to form a coherent and relevant sentence. We've got the cognitive approach. So we've got the thought process of how you're going to answer that question or how you're going to approach that piece of learning and thinking about what you're going to do or what you're going to say. Then you've got the social or emotional aspect of learning, and that's where we develop the learner's confidence in interaction. And if you see some of the previous strategies, some of these previous strategies would work quite well in terms of developing these four types of skills. So what we need to think about then when using an, something like an oracy framework is we need to think about what the success criteria might look like. It's very important for development of young people to be able to set a checklist and that will help the learners to develop those skills. Again, it will give them confidence in order to succeed and move forward. One of the things that learners really like, particularly if they lack confidence, is something like scaffolding. So you might, for example, need to scaffold a sentence or scaffold turn taking. So something that works well there is you could have a magic stick. So when it's their turn to answer a question or demonstrate physical skills, you can give them the stick. That works quite well. Or you could use something more um, basic like a talk token. So not only are we encouraging them to have more confidence and to build up that eye contact, that build up that body language, we're also helping them become more open to working with others and actually sharing that talking space. It's very important as well that we also give them praise because that's really going to help motivate them. So if they do share the space correctly or sensibly, praise them. If they give a really good answer, praise them. If they make eye contact, praise them. And what you could do within that talking circle, for example, is say, right, today we're going to focus on eye contact. When you speak, try to make eye contact with the person opposite you in the circle or something like that we would find would work really effective. Here are some examples from Voice21 about the oracy frameworks that they think about in terms of the skills to be developed under each of those four areas. So when we're looking at things like physical, we're looking at trying to develop how they use their voice. Um, is the tone appropriate? Are they speaking in a way that's clearly understood? Are they projecting their voice so people can hear them? Then we've got the linguistic side of it. So what kind of language are they using? Are they using the correct grammar? Are they speaking like they're on social media? How are they speaking? Are they able to recognise, which is quite difficult for some SEN learners, humour or sarcasm? That might be something that they need to try and develop to understand. Then you've got cognitive. So how they're thinking. So are they giving strong arguments? Are they backing up what they're saying? Are they able to self-regulate? So maintain the focus in the circle. Are they able to time manage? All those different kind of things feed into this importance of this oracy framework. And then the final one, which for some learners can be quite tricky, is the social and emotional learning. So being able to listen before they take their turn, being able to be confident in taking their turn, being able to understand what others are saying. So there's lots of things within these frameworks can, that can be developed all learners will benefit from this, but particularly learners who ascend would also benefit from this quite significantly, although they would have different challenges depending on their um, need of, of in terms of the classroom. So if you'd like to discover more about the qualifications we offer that you could use some of these strategies with, please visit our website at Pearson Qualifications and look for Entry Level Level 1 or Level 1 Introductory and you will see the specifications on there 
by you to browse it, Yara, unless you're 